Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor, and welcome back to another one of our live Q&A sessions here every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a chance for you to talk with us in the chat, ask any questions you might have, and we will answer them live for you. In addition, we also answer questions that you have submitted on our videos through comments this week. Remember, we're trying to put out videos every week on new content, so please like and subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you can get notified when new content comes out. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And remember, please share this channel with your friends and your family. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Anybody who's joining us, please remember you can put any questions that you have into the chat. So we have a lot of really good questions this week. I'm going to start with some questions on antibiotics. So the first question is, hi, is cefuroxime safe during pregnancy? I'm five months pregnant now. Thank you in advance. The next one is, I'm currently 36 weeks pregnant and my OB prescribed nitrofurantoin, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Is it safe for my baby? Please advise. So I lump these two questions together because in general, a lot of the information about antibiotics is the same. If your doctor is prescribing you an antibiotic, that's because they've diagnosed you with a bacterial infection. Antibiotics kill bacteria. They do not treat viruses such as the flu. Now, when you have been diagnosed with a bacterial infection that requires an antibiotic, it's very important that you take all of the antibiotic medicine that they have prescribed for you. The reason for this is that even though you'll start to feel better after a day or two, the antibiotic hasn't actually killed all of the bacteria off. There's still bacteria that's there. If you stop taking the antibiotic after a day or two, that bacteria that's still there will start to replicate and in about a week you'll start to feel very sick again. Only the next time that they prescribe you an antibiotic, it may not work, and they may need to use a stronger antibiotic. So when your doctor or your healthcare provider has determined you need an antibiotic, it's very important that you take it as prescribed. Now, it, the reason why it's so important to treat infections during pregnancy is untreated infections can lead to preterm birth, stillbirth, miscarriage, and other ailments with your baby. So it's very important to treat, and it's far safer to use most antibiotics than it is to leave your infection untreated. So going to the specific antibiotics that have been referenced by these two viewers, cefuroxime and nitrofurantoin are both safe for use during pregnancy, whether it's first trimester, second trimester, or third trimester. Remember, make sure you take all of the antibiotics as prescribed. And if you're ever worried, you can always ask your local pharmacist for additional information on these medications. Now, we also received a different question about antibiotics. Um, this comes from a father. He says, hi, doctor. I had sex outside, and three days later, I noticed some slight discharge on my penis. The doctor prescribed doxyl, ciprobid, and fragile. Can my eight months pregnant wife take the same meds too? asking about the impact on our baby's health. So um, there was a little bit of information that was lost in translation here, but I think I understand what's going on. So when you see discharge, either from the penis or the vagina, you need to suspect a sexually transmitted disease. And sexually transmitted diseases can be very serious to an unborn baby. Among other things, there are some sexually transmitted diseases that if left untreated in the woman can cause blindness at birth. This is why we give babies the antibiotic ointments that we see right after a woman gives birth. Now, this particular person went and got tested and got treated. And so he's wondering if these same antibiotics can be used for his wife. The first thing that needs to happen is she should get tested. There is no reason to give a medication unnecessarily unless she actually tests positive for the disease. Now, after reading the question, I think the three antibiotics that he is referring to is doxycycline, flagyl, 
and ciprofloxacin. So these are the three medications I'm going to reference. If these are not the medications that he is referring to, the three medications listed in the question are not medications used here in the U.S., and you should ask your local pharmacist and healthcare provider. So let's start with Flagyl. Flagyl is a medication that is safe for use during pregnancy. It's very effective at treating cert certain kinds of sexually transmitted diseases, and we use it all the time. The next antibiotic is ciprofloxacin. So ciprofloxacin is an antibiotic that you have to verify benefits versus risks. So, so there are some medications that we use during pregnancy that it depends on what risk we're talking about versus what benefit. So in the case of ciprofloxacin, there's no studies directly on women who are pregnant because that's not considered ethical. However, there are some animal studies that show that there may be some musculoskeletal issues when using ciprofloxacin. So if a woman was in her first trimester, for example, and there was a different antibiotic that might be able to be used, that should probably be considered first. However, a woman who's in the third trimester where most of the musculoskeletal issues have already, or musculoskeletal system has already been developed, ciprofloxacin might be the best choice. Now, the last medication referenced is doxycycline. Doxycycline is contraindicated during pregnancy. Let me repeat that. Doxycycline during any trimester of pregnancy is contraindicated. It is known to cause a wide variety of birth defects, including late in pregnancy. These include musculoskeletal issues, issues with the teeth, preterm birth, and then there can even be complications with mom. So doxycycline should never be used with a pregnant person. So there are other antibiotics that can be used, and she should talk to her healthcare provider about that. But this was a great question to be asked. Um, so we are getting into it. Hi, Jennifer. Welcome. Can my baby sleep on the side at bedtime? I love this question. So the answer is depends. When you first put your baby to sleep, your baby should always be put to sleep on their back. And as a newborn, they need to be put to sleep on their back. Now, one of the things that's been the latest fad is these um, sleep sacks, which really do actually help babies sleep. But the problem is we see babies being swaddled up with their arms kind of tight and covered. And that is actually not very good for your newborn. So babies are designed when they're born to sleep on their back with their arms out. And this protects them from rolling over onto their side or onto their face where they can't correct themselves. So as a young baby, if you put a newborn onto their side and they do happen to roll forward onto their face, they cannot fix that. And therefore it can be a high risk for SIDS. However, eventually, and every baby's different, between three to six months, your baby will start to roll over on their own. As soon as your baby is able to developmentally roll over on their own, if they decide to sleep on their side, it is safe for sleep. Now, let me say that again. If they decide, we should always put the baby to sleep on their back. Now, a lot of people get worried about babies choking. Babies have a natural um, like gag reflex that will keep them from choking on their own vomit. The exception might be a premature baby. So we often get worried that if they're flat on their back, they're going to choke. They, they don't choke. But actually, if you put your baby onto their side before they're developmentally ready, that can actually close off the throat just a tiny bit and actually make choking more likely. So you want to let your baby go to sleep on their back, and you want to make sure that even though they sometimes can sleep a little bit better in that swaddle, their arms are actually out and not tucked in so that they can also correct their sleep, um, their sleep positioning, okay? That was a great question. And anybody who's joining us, please feel free to type questions into the chat like Jennifer did. That's what we're here for. 
Um, going back to some of our questions that we have, um, we get a lot of questions every week about bleeding. Okay. So I had one viewer say, I'm spotting with my seven week twins. I'm on bed rest at the hospital. I'm waiting for it to stop so I can get home. They're going to scan me in the next two days. And I'm hoping that they'll still be strong and have a healthy heartbeat. Um, another mom writes, I'm six weeks pregnant and have spotting over the last two days. Two blood clots came out. I have no pain in my abdomen, so I'm not sure what's happening. This is my second pregnancy, and the first was a miscarriage. Please help me understand what's going on. And the third one, I am seven weeks and five days today, and I have brown spotting over the last three days. Yesterday, severe cramps. Today, I'm going to visit the doctor. I hope everything will be fine. So I put these three questions together because all three of these viewers happen to be around the same gestational age, which is between six and seven weeks. This is in the first trimester. This is often when women are finding out that they are pregnant. So one of the things you wanna know is that bleeding during pregnancy is actually very common, especially during the first trimester. Now, we don't want to see bleeding during pregnancy unless you are in active labor at a birth center, at a home birth with a birth attendant, or in a hospital giving birth. But just so you know, bleeding doesn't necessarily mean a miscarriage is happening. So especially in the first trimester, we see bleeding for a variety of reasons. The first reason is implantation bleeding. So this is where the fertilized egg comes down into the uterus and attaches to the uterine wall. When this happens, you can actually see a little bit of spotting, and that can be implantation bleeding. The second type of bleeding oftentimes comes from having sex. So the hormones that we have um, to sustain a healthy pregnancy, these hormones will thin out vaginal tissue and make it drier. And you also have less of that natural lubrication. So if you have sex, Sometimes that will cause little tiny vaginal tears that can, that can cause bleeding. So it's very important when you are having sex in the first trimester that you use lots of lubrication to prevent this. But that can cause spotting that you may see. Now, one of the other types of spotting is actually related to getting your normal period. Some women will have one more period, even though they are actively pregnant, and this does not hurt the baby necessarily. This is just your body still hasn't quite gotten the idea that it's pregnant, and therefore one more menstrual cycle will go through. Now, there are some other causes, including something called a subchorionic hemorrhage, and we have a video for that. We'll link that into the description for you. And a subchorionic hemorrhage is a type of bleed that happens underneath the placenta. The placenta is the organ that feeds the baby that's attached to the uterine wall. And underneath there, a little pocket of blood may develop and that can leak out and you may see it, you know, on your underwear or your pad. Now, there's different types of bleeding. There's spotting, there's heavy active bleeding, and then there's old bleeding. So this relates to the color. So brown blood, which was mentioned in one of these questions, is old blood. This is the sign that bleeding took place at some point in time, but it's no longer happening. Bright red blood is usually the sign of active bleeding, and pink is usually what we consider spotting. If you see any of these types of bleeding, you need to let your healthcare provider know immediately so that they can assess you. So for example, our mom with twins she is actually on bed rest because that's considered a high-risk pregnancy. And as a high-risk pregnancy, they need to monitor her very carefully. She notes that she was going to have a scan. I'm assuming they're talking about an ultrasound. And if you haven't seen your doctor yet because you're early on, but you start to have spotting, a scan or an ultrasound can tell them, is this a subchorionic hemorrhage? Is this potentially a miscarriage? This is why it's so important for you to go and get checked out. And of course, for some women, when they have pain with this bleeding, that could be a sign of an ectopic pregnancy, which is considered a medical emergency. So even though it's very scary, don't worry until you have a reason to worry because that stress can be an issue for your pregnancy. Instead, call your healthcare provider and ask them what they want you to do next. 
Okay, so I hope I say this right. I'm actually gonna shorten your name. Um, hi, Pavi. Um, I am getting bloating issue and mild pain in my abdomen after three months postpartum. Can you give me a suggestion to get relief? So um, whatever you have abdominal pain, you wanna make sure you let your healthcare provider know. But bloating and mild pain sounds like trapped gas, which may be a sign of constipation. So constipation is actually very common during pregnancy. And we it actually can lead to hemorrhoids, which is one of the most common complications of pregnancy. And we have a video on that that we'll link in the description. But actually, when we're speaking about bleeding in pregnancy, sometimes the bleeding is actually a hemorrhoid and, and moms don't realize it's coming from the anus versus um, the vagina. When you're getting back to the bloating um, and the mild pain, oftentimes pain from gas is like a sharp stabbing pain. Um, it's not that crampy type of feeling. And of course, bloating because your belly's kind of full of air that needs to come out. So the reason why this happens during pregnancy is everything kind of slows down because of the growing baby and it's squishing on your, your intestines and stuff. One of the things you can do to help with that is you can go ahead and you can um, eat like prunes, drink prune juice, maybe apples or applesauce to help stimulate stuff and get things moving along, okay? Um, you want to ask your healthcare provider if you can use um, Colace. Colace is a stool softener that helps to bring water into the bowel to stop it, soften the stool so you can actually go to the bathroom easier, which will also allow that trapped gas to come out. Walking really helps with gas. And so you want to be walking every day, which is also very helpful for your pregnancy. And, you know, finally, laying on your side, especially your left side, can help to get that gas to move. Now, before we just assume that this is gas, because you have pain, you want to let your healthcare provider know. They may want to do an ultrasound to look and make sure nothing else is going on. For example, like your appendix being an issue, okay? Now, bloating can sometimes happen on its own. It's basically because you got a big uterus kind of um, growing up into that area. And so you feel very heavy in the front and the pain might actually be, um, round ligament pain. So the ligaments are these like stretchy bands that help hold up your organs, your ovaries and your uterus. And sometimes as the uterus gets heavier, those bands kind of stretch and it can cause a different type of pain. So make sure you tell your healthcare provider, but it sounds to me like that might be like a gas issue. Jennifer, I see your question. Is it okay for me to put my one-year-old in the crib with a pacifier? Absolutely, yes, 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 yes. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends the use of a pacifier while sleeping to help prevent or help reduce the risk of SIDS. And this should happen once a baby is successfully breastfeeding. So if you're formula feeding, you can start it right away. It's not a problem. If you are breastfeeding, they usually recommend you start using a pacifier during sleep between two to three weeks of age. So the idea with a pacifier during sleep is that when the baby is actively sucking, it keeps your baby in a slightly lighter amount of sleep, like a lighter state of sleep. And that lighter state well, it means the baby could wake up a little bit more often, also means the baby's not going into such a deep sleep that we think may or may not contribute to SIDS. So pacifier use during sleep is considered protective against SIDS, and I would absolutely use that pacifier. Um, you know, it's okay if your baby needs to use a pacifier even up until age two. Remember, this is a self-soothing um, type of uh, idea. So, you know, pacifier use is okay. Um, it isn't recommended for use when the baby is not sleeping because it can interfere with speech. Um, Phoenix, welcome. Um, I'm glad to hear that I answered some of your questions. I really am glad that you're enjoying this. And if you have any other questions, feel free to put them into the chat. I'm going to go ahead and our next question that we got was about breast pain. 
I'm having pain in my left breast and redness over the last three months. I've had an ultrasound done and that's fine. But over the last two days, I'm having dryness on my left breast. So this question came to us on our yeast video. And I, I think that this person is suspecting that she has a yeast infection in the breast. So yeast infect, sorry, yeast infections of the breast usually present with a dark, I'm so sorry, with a deep, sharp stabbing pain deep into the chest, like really, really deep. And it feels very much like a needle piercing the breast. It can also present with red, shiny skin on the top of the breast and a flaky type of appearance or a lot of itchiness. Yeast infections can occur at any time um, while you are breastfeeding. Usually if the mom develops a yeast infection, the baby is also going to have a yeast infection. So when treated, we need to treat both mom and baby unless mom is exclusively pumping, in which case only mom needs to be treated. Now, sometimes we have treatment resistant yeast that's very subclinical. So subclinical, it's hard to diagnose because there's not a lot of yeast in the samples they collect. And the symptoms are very mild. So it's very hard to diagnose off of just um, symptoms alone. When a mom has something like this, like this mom, which has been lasting for months, you need to go to a breast specialist. And in this case, I always send my patients to a breast cancer specialist. So what you need to understand is that the same ducks that we have that hold our milk are also ducts that rare types of cancer can uh, occur in. And some of these cancers are fed by the same hormones that we have during our pregnancy and lactation. So if you're having any kind of symptoms that can't be diagnosed after months, you want to see a breast cancer specialist. Among other things, they have the latest technology for imaging they're the ones that are the experts on doing biopsies. So sometimes these areas are deep in the breast and you need to actually, in the case of a yeast infection, pull out the milk from that area to determine if it's yeast and what kind of yeast so you can treat it. So these breast cancer specialists oftentimes know how to do these very careful biopsies and get the best images so you can get the quickest diagnosis and the best treatment. If you do have a yeast infection in the breast, oftentimes you need to take an oral yeast medication. But when you're a woman who's taking an oral yeast medication, a pill for a vaginal yeast infection, sometimes it's only one day or three days of treatment. For these breast yeast infections, you often need two to three weeks of treatment, which is a mistake a lot of providers make. So by seeing a breast specialist, you will often get somebody who is also familiar with the fact that you need to have um, that treated more carefully. So that's a really good question, and, and that's how I would handle that one. Um, for those of you who are joining us, hi, I'm Dr. Samantha, the Maternity Mentor. Please remember you can put any of your questions live into the chat, and we'll get to those. So this week, I was very excited to see that we actually had a lot of questions about depression and anxiety medications during pregnancy. And I really um, am very passionate about this topic. So let's get into it. So the first question was, hi, doctor, is Escitopax 10 milligrams safe during pregnancy? Are Escitopax and Escitalopram both the same? And which is better? So Escitopax is the same as escitalopram. And for those of you who are wondering, it's ESCI. And that's, I'm just saying that in case you were wondering what we're talking about. Escitalopram is also known as Lexapro. So these two medications are basically the same. And Lexapro is safe for use during pregnancy and postpartum if you are breastfeeding. Lexapro is an SSRI. This is an antidepressant that increases serotonin, which helps to treat both depression and anxiety. It can also be used for panic, and it can even be used for a little bit of OCD. It's extremely safe and has a very low risk of side effects, and that's why we like to use it, and I, it's a great medication. 
One of the things that I see in this question is a milligram strength, 10 milligrams. So for anybody who's watching, one of the things you need to know is that the milligram strength depends for each woman. And what's most important is that we treat your depression to remission during pregnancy. So if your depression or anxiety is left minimally treated, that still causes stress to the baby and can cause a lot of issues, including preterm birth, miscarriage, and um, sometimes a uh, small for gestational age or small baby. So you want to make sure that it is actually treated properly. You don't want to leave depression or anxiety um, untreated. Helen, I see your question. I'm going to get to it in just a minute because that's a great question about that med. So the next question was, what about mirtazapine? So mirtazapine is also an SSRI. And it's also called Remeron. This medication is also used for anxiety, depression, and it's actually really good at treating it. It has one unique side effect that is that it makes you really, really sleepy. So oftentimes we will use this for patients who also have trouble sleeping. Um, one other interesting thing about Remeron that we have to be careful with is Remeron increases your appetite significantly. So for somebody who's already overweight or is at risk for having diabetes or has diabetes, we want to make sure that we don't use this medication. Now, one of the things you need to be aware of with um, mirtazapine or Remeron is that there is some indication that there may be an increased chance of preterm birth or miscarriage. Usually miscarriage is not miscarriage after a pregnancy has been established, but in animal studies, there is some evidence to believe that pregnancies, the egg will fertilize, but never be able to attach to the uterine wall. Um, so in this case, if you are preconception, which one of the things I do is I work with women who are thinking about becoming pregnant, this might be a medication you want to get off. Um, now, as far as preterm birth, it just you can be later on in the pregnancy and potentially have a higher risk for that. Mirtazapine, there's a lot of other options, whether you're using it for sleep or for um, anxiety, depression. So it warrants a discussion with your healthcare provider. Um, another one that was asked, I'm planning for pregnancy and I have anxiety. I'm using Depaxil 25 milligrams. Can I use this with my pregnancy? Depaxil is also called paroxetine or Paxil in the United States. Paxil is contraindicated during pregnancy. This means you can't use it. Now, what I'm going to tell you is this. We don't use it anymore because of one singular study. So there was a study a long time ago that showed that Paxil increased the risk of cardiac or heart uh, defects in pregnancy when the baby was early on. This study was poorly done, and the data has not been able to be replicated. And most people now believe that Paxil is safe for use. However, because we can't say for sure, we no longer use it, and it is still considered contraindicated or you cannot use. So if you are not pregnant yet, you want to talk to your healthcare provider about switching you to a different medication, a medication such as Zoloft, Lexapro, or Prozac, which are all very similar to um, Paxil and definitely might be able to be used. So now for Helen, I'm on 150 milligrams of bupropion and eight weeks pregnant. Should I continue with the medication or stop? So bupropion, for anybody else who's listening, is also called Welbutrin. So Welbutrin is a medication that we usually use for depression. It can also be used for energy, motivation. It can help people quit smoking, quit drinking. It can be used for mood stabilization, and it can be used for ADHD. So it's a fantastic medication, and it often helps people lose weight also. So a lot of people really, really, really like this medication. However, while butrin comes with a risk, it actually protects you from seizures. So there's an increased risk of having seizures if you were to get your dosing schedule off. And as a pregnant woman, later on in your pregnancy, you're going to actually be at a higher risk for seizures. So we usually actually try to get you off of this medication for you more than for your baby.
Now you cannot just stop this medication cold turkey. You need to talk to a healthcare provider, but you want to see if maybe they can switch you to a different medication for use for depending on whether it's um, depression or anxiety. This is not something that you necessarily have to be really super worried about your baby, but it is something for your health during the pregnancy that we try to switch you off of. Okay, so you definitely want to get with um, your healthcare provider to talk about your options. But remember, it is very important to treat depression and anxiety. Untreated depression and anxiety has its own risks for you and for your baby. Um, our final question about depression um, during pregnancy is from a viewer who says, I would like to know your opinion about L-theanine during pregnancy. So L-theanine is a vitamin, okay? So this is a homeopathic treatment for depression and anxiety. And I love this question. So in my day-to-day -day practice, I very much recommend homeopathic remedies all the time, okay? I think the use of Eastern and Western medica medicine together is perfect for most human beings and including pregnant women in a lot of cases. However, vitamins are the one exception. So there are a lot of standard vitamins that a pregnant woman should take. For example, her prenatal vitamin, which gives her a lot of the nutrients she needs for a healthy pregnancy. One-offs like B12, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc. These are all vitamins that we have used for hundreds of years. They've been well studied in all these different avenues, and we know that your baby will be safe with them. But there's a lot of other vitamins and minerals that are coming out onto the market that tout all sorts of good um, benefits. And in a lot of other countries, we know that these have been used for many years, and they do provide these benefits. The problem is they are not FDA regulated. So what does that mean? That means these factories can be producing a whole bunch of different vitamins with a whole bunch of different ingredients. And you don't know if the vitamin that you've picked is pure. So one example of a vitamin you cannot have while you are pregnant is black cohosh. Black cohosh has a risk for miscarriage. If you have a factory that's producing L-theanine and black cohosh, and some of that gets mixed together, you could be taking a vitamin that may actually be very harmful to your pregnancy. So again, because these aren't FDA regulated, we don't know what ingredients, what fillers, what else is being produced, they're not being tested. You should stay clear of any vitamins and minerals that aren't very standardized and something that your healthcare provider recommends. All right, so um, I see Jennifer. How do I get my baby to not suck so hard when she nurses? My baby is one year old. Hmm, that's a very good question. So it, it, it actually depends on why she's sucking so hard. So if it's when she's going to feed, like if she's due for a feeding when she sits down, I would question whether maybe your milk supply is starting to dry up a little bit. If your, your letdown might be a little bit slower and that's why she's sucking so hard. It could also be because she's teething. Even at one years old, we continue to have some teething and she may be a little aggressive due to that. So it's kind of hard to say it would be better to know the why. Now, as far as like getting her to calm down, there's not much you can do with the exception of if she's going to eat, you might be able to feed her a little bit from a bottle or a cup ahead of time to kind of make her a little less hungry so she's a little less aggressive. If you suspect that it has to do with um, teething, she might need a little bit of Tylenol to help with that before she starts to breastfeed. So it really depends on the why to figure out how to get her to not suck so hard. And sometimes it's habit. You know, when we have a two month old, it's a lot easier to correct some of the bad habits than it is for our older kids. But usually when I see it with my older kids, 
it's because they are either teething or they're very, very hungry. Now, you can try to correct the behavior. If the sucking hard hurts, you can try to teach her that that hurts. So what you can do is you can stop her. You can, you know, if she starts to hurt you, you say, no, that hurts, mommy. Okay. You can even de-latch her and say, no, that hurts. But then what you want to do is when she's sucking properly, you want to say, thank you. That feels good. You know, nice sucking, whatever, because she will learn the difference. Um, so it's okay to tell her when it hurts. As soon as she starts to put two and two together, she may modify her behavior to make it more comfortable for you. Um, thank you for joining us. Anybody who's coming in now, I'm Dr. Samantha, the Maternity Mentor. We're here for our live Q&A session that we have every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them live. And we're also answering any questions that you guys may have submitted um, over the week on some of our um, some of our uh, videos. So um, the next question that I got was about labor. So I'm 35 weeks and three days pregnant with my second child. I do not remember feeling like this with my first child since 7:30 p.m. to till at the time she wrote this question, 3 a.m. My tummy feels bloated. I just went to the restroom, which was heavy on poop, and it's making my lower pelvic area hurt. Is this normal? A sign of labor. Could it be that I just am constipated? So this is an interesting question. So when we go into labor, one of the things our body will do oftentimes is our body will cause us to poop. This is because the intestines are sitting down there right next to the vagina and the uterus. And if you are constipated, and as I mentioned earlier tonight, you can get constipated very regularly during pregnancy. There's a whole bunch of poop sitting in there and that can interfere with the baby coming down through the pelvis. So a lot of times when your body senses that you're about to go into labor, it wants to like get all that poop out. And so you'll start to have cramping and you'll start going poop and you can even get diarrhea. And yes, this could be a sign of, of early labor, especially if you are um, pregnant with your second baby. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll see you next Monday. So you want to make sure that you're talking to your healthcare provider if you do feel this way, because it might be a sign of labor. Any pain, especially towards the end of your pregnancy, needs to be investigated to make sure something else isn't going on. Whenever you have pain and you have issues with um, your colon and pooping, you want to also check because it could be that um, you have um, an appendix issue, okay? So don't take for granted any pain, okay? Um, cause it's very important that it get investigated. Um, Hey Phoenix. So I've been talking to my doctor about starting gabapentin due to nerve damage in my left shoulder. I'm hesitant due to me nursing. He wants to start off at 600 milligrams. Will it be safe for my son? So one of the things that I am going to do is I am going to look at my drug guide. So as a practitioner, we um, look at a whole bunch of different resources. Your healthcare provider should be doing this and your, um, your pharmacists do this as well. One of the reasons why we look at these things is to see data that's been collected about these medications. So... Okay. Um, and this is one of the things I thought. So gabapentin is considered safe for nursing after the first month or so postpartum. Okay. So gabapentin is used for a variety of things, including seizures. Very little of it goes into the milk. So one of the things that we look at is, is a medication fat soluble? How big is the molecule size? And this makes a difference as to how much, it, how much of it 
goes into your milk, okay? Now, for that, um, looking at this, this medication, not a lot of it goes in, but because it can be used for seizures, it's recommended only after your baby's about a month or two old, and then it's a little bit safer. However, you could use gabapentin if you needed to. Now, one of the things that I will say about gabapentin is gabapentin is amazing. It can be used for anxiety. It can be used for depression. It can be used for sleep. So it's got a lot of different things that it can be used for. Um, so I will tell you that 600 milligrams is good, but I would ask them to start you at 100. So in my practice and most nurse practitioners, we start patients at low doses because there's no reason to believe that a low dose might not provide the right amount of relief for you. The other thing is you are a breastfeeding mom, which means you have the right to decide to maybe use less medication and have a little bit of pain versus more medication and no pain. So it really depends on how much, you know, you want to deal with. If you were talking about an infection, you need to take something that kills the entire infection. That's 100% effective. But with pain, that's kind of subjective. You shouldn't be sitting in pain at a six, okay? Take the gabapentin, right? But pain of a two or a three might be okay for you. Gabapentin, I would definitely ask if you could start at a lower dose. Um, it, it definitely is available and I would see. Because the other thing is, how often does he want you to take it? You know, maybe a lower dose more frequently, which ends up being less overall, might be just as good for you. And then remember, okay, a lot of people discount it, but ice. Ice is amazing. Ice is very natural, homeopathic will not hurt your baby and can be successfully used for stuff like nerve pain. You just want to make sure if you use ice, okay, your shoulder, make sure the ice isn't coming down here onto your chest where your where some of your milk ducts are going to be, okay? Because if you get ice on your milk ducts, that can actually help dry up your milk. But ice up here on the top of the shoulder is perfectly safe and can help with your pain. Um, so I would definitely ask, I would definitely consider that as well. And then the other thing is that may also be helpful if the gabapentin doesn't work is Cymbalta. Okay. Cymbalta can be used for pain. Um, you're welcome, Phoenix. So we have a question about placentas. Hi, doctor. Please explain placenta posterior encroaching on the internal os. I'm very worried. So we have a uterus, okay? This is where your baby lives. The placenta is the organ that feeds the baby and it attaches to the side of the uterus and then the umbilical cord comes out into your baby's belly button. And the job of the placenta is to filter all the nutrients and toxins. So blood goes into the baby that has nutrients and oxygen and the blood that comes out has all the toxins and the carbon dioxide. And our bodies actually do the job of being the filter. Okay? So what happens with the placenta is here's your uterus. And at the bottom here, this is the cervix. Okay? So the cervix should be long, thick, and closed. Okay? And this top part is what we call the os, the internal os, because it's inside the uterus. Okay. A placenta normally sits like kind of in the middle of the side of the uterus, or it could be in the back, which is posterior. That's what this person's talking about. Or in the front, actually, this is be posterior to you guys. And in the front, which is anterior. Okay. But when it's encroaching the internal os, that means this placenta is kind of sitting down low. So it's sitting like right on the edge of that. If it covers part of it, that's a partial placenta previa. And if it covers all of it, that's a complete placenta previa. And we have videos on that and we can link that in the description. But a placenta previa can be a cause of not only bleeding, but preterm birth. And if it's a complete previa, the need for a cesarean section. If you have a complete previa, you cannot have a vaginal delivery. Now, 
When it's encroaching, it just means that it's simply getting a little bit closer to it. However, as your pregnancy progresses, it's very common for placentas to move. However, they don't detach and move. They simply grow with the uterus. And usually they grow away from the internal os. So this is probably going to be no big deal at all. It shouldn't interfere. The biggest thing you should know is that if you start to bleed, you want to let your healthcare provider know immediately. Um, our next question is about morning sickness. I started vomiting at 11 weeks. However, I did have nausea before that. I'm still vomiting at 23 weeks. It's better for two days after 20 weeks, but it came back worse. I was on medication since week 13, but it was not helping. I'm not sure if it's hyperemesis gravidarum. I'm asking because I've had extreme motion sickness growing up until now. It's a tough journey, especially when everyone's saying it will get better. But when? So hyperemesis gravidarum. So I had hyperemesis gravidarum with both of my pregnancies. For my first pregnancy, my daughter, I was hospitalized for a week on IV fluids. I was sick up until about 30 weeks of pregnancy. I had one week of relief, and then I found out I had gallbladder issues, and I was sick for the rest of that pregnancy. Um, I gained about seven pounds for the entire pregnancy, and I never really had a big giant belly um, because of it, which is fine. It was probably better. So I completely understand. When I had my son, I vomited every single day of that pregnancy. At about 30 weeks, I vomited eight times in a day that caused me to go into preterm labor. And I had to go to the hospital and get medication to stop that labor. I vomited every day after that. And I was on Zofran the entire time. So I understand. When you're having extreme nausea and vomiting, that is considered hyperemesis gravidarum. Um, unfortunately, it sometimes will last the entire pregnancy. The nice thing is for most women with hyperemesis gravidarum, and you can hear all sorts of stories, including from celebrities, the second that baby leaves your body, it's gone instantaneously. And for both of my deliveries, that's exactly what happened. It was like done, which is wonderful because you feel instantly better. However, you got to wait until you get, get, that baby born. Um, one of the things that can help with that is a medication called Diclegis. Diclegis is a prescription medicine specifically for hyperemesis gravidarum. The problem is Diclegis is usually not covered by health insurance. So OBGYNs have figured out that Diclegis is actually the combination of two over-the-counter medications, vitamin B6 and Unisom. So a lot of OBGYN providers will tell you to go get Unisom and vitamin B6 and take them together at night. You should talk to your healthcare provider and make sure that this is safe for your pregnancy because everybody's health history is a little bit different. But if this is an option for you, I would totally tell you to do it. Now, another thing that you can do is you can actually um, do C-bands which are bands that put pressure onto your wrist at certain Chinese pressure points. These pressure points have been known to um, lower your nausea and help with morning sickness. Um, some women will um, also use ginger and a variety of ginger um, type products, anywhere from ginger ale to ginger pops to um, you can actually use fresh ginger root. That has been shown to help with stomach issues as well. What I am going to tell you is sometimes there is no treatment. And I hate to say this. Um, it can be very frustrating for women. So I think what's more important than telling you that it's going to get better soon is to tell you that you're doing an amazing job. I used to take a sip of water and lay down and say, just keep it down for five minutes. Just keep it down for five minutes. Or I'd take a bite of food and I'd say, I just got to keep it down for 15 minutes. And I, and I spent a lot of time doing that type of thing, a bite here, a sip there. That's what you do. Okay. You just keep pushing forward, knowing that there is an end in sight. There is an end. It is the birth of your baby. And once that happens, you're going to feel a lot better then. Okay. Try to make sure your food is nutrient dense. That means whole foods that are 
full of fresh, yummy things. Some women can't really tolerate a lot of chewing and stuff. So for example, you can take some of these really healthy foods and make smoothies. That's a great way to be able to take little sips of stuff that's very, very, very high in nutrients. Okay. Um, Gatorade. Gatorade is fantastic for getting little bits of liquid and getting some of those electrolytes that you need, especially if you're vomiting. Um, you want to make sure that you're checking in with your healthcare provider. Just so you know, you can you you can lose a lot of weight while you are pregnant and still have a healthy, safe pregnancy and a healthy baby. So weight loss is not necessarily indicative of an issue that's happening. Um, but you want to make sure you're trying to keep your health up to the best of your ability. And then ask your doctor about nausea medication. And one of the best times to take nausea medication is actually when you're taking your prenatal vitamin. So you still need to try to take a prenatal vitamin. You want to take it every night when you're going to sleep because that's the best chance of you keeping it down. Um, gummy, liquid, tablet, whatever you can do, that's what you do. Okay. And you know, you'll get through it. You'll get through it. Um, I wish I could say more than that. Uh, what should I do if my baby wakes up tonight and starts stirring and moving? Do I take her out or leave her in? Ooh, that is a big question, Jennifer. So we have, uh, two videos on sleep training. Um, so what you're asking is basically about sleep training. So what I'm going to tell you is tonight you should do whatever you've been doing because you need to look at sleep training a lot more carefully. So it's not as simple as leaving her in or taking her out. There's a lot of different sleep training techniques. And depending on which one you choose depends on how you interact with your baby in the room. Some sleep training techniques say pick up the baby for certain intervals and then put baby back down. Some you don't pick up the baby, but you'll go in the room and talk to the baby, pat the baby's back, rub, you know, all that good stuff. So it actually really depends on how you choose to let her start to self-soothe in her bed, which means you've got to look and see which type of training method you're the most comfortable with. Some people choose to do cry it out. This is where you just let the baby cry until the baby goes back to sleep. There's nothing wrong with any of these sleep training techniques. But if you choose to start one, you need to stick with it. The worst thing is to start, say, for example, letting, letting the baby cry it out. And you go for three or four days and the baby's crying and crying and crying. And you stick through. And then on day five, you give up and just pick up the baby. This is the fastest way for your baby to figure out that if they cry long enough, you will give in. So once you decide a technique, you cannot give in. You need to just stick it to the end. It will be worth it. And it is successful as long as you're tough. Okay. But you can't decide that just tonight. You need to really look at it. Sorry, Jennifer. Um, couple more questions that we have. We're kind of getting close to the end. Make sure you put any questions you have in the chat. Um, UTIs, urinary tract infections. I'm 30 weeks pregnant and facing a urinary tract infection. My doctor suggested that I take NIFTAs 100 milligrams, but I'm a diabetic patient. Due to taking this medication, my glucose is raising. What do I do? So NIFTAs is the antibiotic nitrofurantoin, which we talked about earlier, which is safe for pregnancy. And it's also known as macrobid. Urinary tract infections are one of the most common infections that a woman can get while she is pregnant. A urinary tract infection is an infection inside the bladder. So the bladder is the ball that holds your urine and outside is the urethra. So what happens is a lot of times we'll get bacteria that comes up the urethra because our urethra is really short and it connects down by the vagina. And so what happens is bacteria goes up, it gets into the bladder, and then your baby sits on the bladder kind of, so you can't always empty out all the pee. So as a result, you end up um, with bacteria growing inside there, and that can cause the infection. So that infection requires antibiotic treatment. Now, in this case, she is saying that this medication is causing her blood sugar to rise. So if you're diabetic, one of the most important things you can do for the health of your pregnancy and the health of yourself is to keep your sugar levels low. 
However, this medication is going to be used for a very short period of time, usually seven to 10 days. And if you take it all as prescribed, this should clear out the infection after the 10 days. This is only going to raise your sugar for this amount of time. So as long as you take it as prescribed, the infection goes away, your sugar should stabilize again a couple days after finishing the medication. So I absolutely would take this medication because urinary tract infections left untreated can lead to miscarriage, stillbirth, or it can turn into a systemic infection, an all-over infection called pyelonephritis, which can cause sepsis and it can actually kill you, the mom. So I would absolutely take this medication. Hi, Muriel. Um, welcome, welcome. Um, we have a question. I'm 33 weeks pregnant, and it is painful for me to get up from my bed in the morning. It is also painful when I want to stand up from sitting on the floor, and it hurts when I wear pants. Please explain. So this is a uh, mom asking about pelvic pain. This is on our pelvic pain, um, you know, video. So one of the things that happens during our pregnancy is we have an increase in a hormone called relaxin, which is funny, it kind of sounds like relaxing. Relaxin's job is to loosen up joints. So this is my, my wrist, right? And this is a joint. And there's ligaments and tendons in here. And my body right now keeps this at a certain stiffness. Well, the same thing happens in your pelvis, where your hips and your legs kind of me, all that stuff during your, your delivery has to open up to allow the baby to come down and be delivered vaginally. So what happens with that is these joints need to be able to, to loosen up. And that's what relaxin's job is. Relaxin's job is to help allow that to happen. But as a result, as things start to shift and move and you get this bigger belly, that can actually cause stiffness and soreness and pain in those joints because now you're putting extra weight and pressure in places that you didn't used to do it. This is why a lot of women end up with that waddle towards the end of their pregnancy. That waddle is because of these loosening joints and relaxing. Now, the thing that I would tell you is you want to make sure that you're talking to your healthcare provider about this. Because it also sounds a little interesting that you are having pain specifically in the morning and that it hurts to wear pants. Hurting to wear pants and pain in the morning could be a sign of swelling. So swelling is where you have an excess like water under the skin and it can make you seem puffy. And swelling can be a sign of um, some medical conditions, which can be very serious, including preeclampsia and eclampsia. And we have a video on that. So we'll link that into the description. But eclampsia is associated with um, high blood pressure. And these two things can cause swelling. And that swelling can make your legs feel very tight and thick and stiff. And that could lead to some of this pain. So it's very important that you make sure you're checking your um, blood pressure to see if that may be elevating because that could be part of the issue and that would need to be addressed with your healthcare provider. Some other real quick symptoms of eclampsia include headaches, difficulty with your eyes. So blurry vision, spots, floaters, changes in the vision or pain in the upper right part of your stomach. If you're having any of those with this pelvic pain that you're talking about, you want to go ahead and call your healthcare provider. Um, so that's all the questions from our videos. Um, I see Jen, you asked one more question. How do I get my one-year-old to smile? She keeps wanting to cry instead of smile. Um, that's a good question. I would tell you that you need to do a lot of play with her. And when she does smile for you, you want to reinforce that question. Um, or sorry, you want to reinforce that behavior. So she needs to learn that she gets rewarded for that. The other thing is, even when she's crying, you want to just remind her, be happy and show her that smile. Smile lots with lots of soft tones and positive reinforcement, and that may help her learn how to do it. If you don't notice a lot of smiling, you want to point that out to your pediatrician. You want to make sure that they are screening her developmentally for any other issues. 
Okay. Sometimes that can be a sign of something else, or it could be a sign that she's not feeling good. So you want to make sure that they look at that. Um, so for those of you who are still here, thank you so much for joining us. I am Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor. We are here every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to answer your questions live, as well as answering the questions that you have submitted on our videos. Please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out. Hit the notification button so you can get our latest content um, and notified when new videos come out. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please recommend us to your friends and family. And remember to tell them about this live Q&A where we come here to talk with you. We love talking with you. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Samantha, the Maternity Mentor. Bye for now.